Um, so yes, Charlie Munger, uh, like Ryan said in the intro, uh, with Charlie Munger's recent passing on November 28th of 2023 at 99 years old, I thought that I would include him as our investor spotlight on the podcast, uh, considering his fabulous investing career and his overall life philosophy, which I tend to agree with. So to give a quick rundown on his life, Charlie was born in 1924 in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, and as a teenager, he worked at Buffett and Son, a grocery store owned actually by Warren Buffett's grandfather, Ernest P. Buffett. And he enrolled in the University of Michigan, uh, but at 19 years old in 1943, he dropped out and joined the military, but eventually returned to Harvard Law School, where he got a law degree. Uh, and just a little bit of a fun fact. Uh, he didn't end up meeting Warren actually until 1959 at a dinner party in Omaha. So even though he did work at uh, his his grandpa's uh, um, store, they you know had only basically crossed paths. Now he managed his own investment firm from 1962 to 1975, and over that period, according to one of Warren's books. Uh, Charlie earned on average an annual return of 19.8% over that period versus uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which returned 5%. Uh, he joined Berkshire Hathaway in 1978 as vice chairman, and he was also the CEO of Westco Financial from 1984 to 2011, which essentially Westco started as a savings and loan institution, but it was eventually or but it eventually held a concentrated equity portfolio and was uh, eventually acquired by Berkshire Hathaway. Now, I wrote an article a few years back on Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger's investing styles after I watched the 2017 HBO special called Becoming Warren Buffett. And you can actually find the article on our website if you are interested in reading it. And what I came to understand after watching the documentary is that both Charlie and Warren's value investing principles were relatively the same. However, Warren praised Charlie for taking him beyond the limited scope of Benjamin Graham's value investing philosophy, where uh, Warren actually said, Charlie shoved me in the direction of not just buying bargains as Ben Graham had taught me. This was the real impact he had on me. It took a powerful force to move me on from Graham's limited views. It was the power of Charlie's mind. He expanded my horizons. And to fully grasp what Warren means here, uh, we can look at both of their, their strategies early on in their career. So first, Warren's strategy, he essentially came to rely on uncovering stocks that were trading at deep discounts to the market, frequently gravitating towards small cap or thinly traded stocks where opportunities were potentially being overlooked because these thinly traded stocks were not followed by many analysts. Now, Charlie's strategy, on the other hand, focused on good stocks that were trading near or at fair value. And these businesses may not be extremely cheap, but the technology or economic moat that the company maintains is far superior to others and could provide investors solid returns over the long term. And this economic moat investing strategy of buying great businesses at fair values rather than discounted prices was what Warren came to learn early in his relationship with Charlie. And he quotes this many times. So the bottom line is that both Charlie and Warren's valuation principles were the same, never purchasing overvalued stocks in relation to their cash flows. But ultimately, the stocks that they gravitated to at the beginning of their careers had very uh, or had a very different profile. So uh, lastly here, just to go through a few key points on Charlie's philosophy uh, and yeah, it's just some quotes. So on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, he says, crypto is an investment in nothing. I regarded it as almost insane to buy this stuff or to trade it. It's just ridiculous that anybody would buy this stuff as there is no compelling reason to own it. Stocks, which represent pieces of real businesses and claims to their profits are far superior investments. I would agree. When he uh, was asked about EBITDA at one of uh, the Berkshire Hathaway's annual meetings, he said, uh, I think you would understand any presentation using the word EBITDA if every time you saw that word, you just substituted to the phrase bullshit earnings. <laughs> Not thinking about depreciation as an expense strikes us as absolutely crazy. Now, he also went on to uh, coin the term uh, Lollapalooza effect during a 1995 Harvard speech. 
Uh, and essentially, he says that, you know, humans have many inherent biases and tendencies that can sway our behavior one way or another. And when several of them act in concert to drive us toward a particular action, you have a Lollapalooza effect. And the Lollapalooza effect can create large scale drivers of human behavior and often error. And a good example of this is the 2008 selling of subprime mortgages, uh, because essentially it became commonplace uh, in the banking industry, but obviously ended up uh, in disaster. Now, this next quote, uh, and this is the last one, but it is my all time favorite, as I like to think of myself as a student of stoicism, and is probably why I've come to love Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett so much, because they radiate a stoic attitude toward investing and life. So Charlie's quote here is the first rule of a happy life is low expectations. If you have unrealistic expectations, you're going to be miserable your whole life. You want to have reasonable expectations and take life's results, good and bad, as they happen with a certain amount of stoicism. Now, this quote is so similar to wisdom from ancient philosophers, such as you know Buddha, who said happiness does not depend on what you have or who you are. It solely relies on what you think. Socrates said, contentment is natural wealth. Luxury is artificial poverty. Plato said the greatest wealth is to live content with little. So the similarity here to these ancient quotes is that Charlie is essentially saying you must control your own mind's expectations and judgments to live a happy life, uh, which is essentially the underlying uh, principle of stoicism. And a happy life is what I believe Charlie lived based on this principle. So that is uh, my piece on Charlie Munger, RIP. Good, good job. Yeah, I mean did, it's uh, it's it's pretty incredible that he was still going to work every day at ninety nine yeah. years old. Um, yeah, yeah, I find that one of the most amazing parts yeah. about him. Yeah. And, and like he took hours and hours of questions at this year's annual general meeting at ninety nine up yeah. there, mm -hmm. still very much in it, and still yeah. very much on um, you know lucid and 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 part of the investment decisions of uh, Berkshire at this stage. It's amazing. Did you I'm guys know that Warren Buffett is always seen as like the the front man, yeah. the face of Berkshire Hathaway? But I've always suspected that a lot of the brains behind it was more attributable to to Charlie than than people really gave him credit for. Like if you watch the AGMs, you know Warren Buffett he's very charismatic. He likes to joke around, tell jokes, tell stories, and stuff like that. Whereas you know Munger is just a very straight shooter to the point where like. Sometimes he shoots so straight with his answers and just right to the point that people yeah. like, including Warren will like laugh because, <laughs> you know, his answer is going to be like a four word sentence. Whereas, you know, Warren will go on and on with the story and an analogy and a, you know, so it's. Yeah, no, I think there was a good team in that respect to have yeah. the two, I mean, two it's, from it's, those perspectives. And as Brennan said, he even credits charlie uh for expanding his investing yeah. horizons because yeah. he had a very warren had a very rigid criteria basically when he started yeah like yeah. you could almost make the analogy or the similarity where like at keystone ryan's you know the face aaron's behind the scene the brains you know you can almost make <laughs> yeah we're just gonna move <laughs> on from that and um uh, do you do you know that as a fun fact to to keep actually let's keep up with that facade right there and say that do you know that um he trained as a meteorologist during World War II. I did know. Did anybody well, know? I did know that doing my research, but yeah, yeah. So he was a meteorologist for I think the Air Force. Uh, yeah. um, I, I, I I think his life would have turned out differently if he was like your guy on Channel Six Weatherman. You know, like that would yeah. be a little bit different. If Charlie Munger, I'd love to see that though. Charlie Munger being the <laughs> the Channel Six Weatherman. Just that would be a, a different life and uh, maybe a different impact on uh, the invest or the world, generally speaking, that he would have had. But I'd still like to see him uh, in front of one of those screens pointing out, you know, yeah. a high of six, a low of whatever. <laughs>